Some weeks ago, I began doing a series of comparisons between this Siglent SDS-1102X oscilloscope and this Rigol DS or MSO 1074Z uh, and I did them in many many parts the reason was at the time uh, being very new to YouTube I was only able to upload uh, 10 or 12 minute segments and so I divided everything into segments but I have been asked by uh, a couple of viewers if I could uh, fix up that series a little bit better and make it a little more watchable, a little more findable. So I've tried to incorporate most of the suggestions people have made. And what I'm doing here is I'm combining all of parts one through three in this first video. And then I will try to combine uh, segments from the, uh, the rest of the series so that they represent uh, a more viewable set of uh, 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 videos. So this is mainly just to explain what I'm doing and where I'm going. Uh, you'll see it as this video uh, unwinds that it basically is parts one, uh, parts two, and parts three all combined together into one uh, much longer uh, video. So I hope this will work for everybody and I look forward to your comments if you uh, like this this better format than what I had in, in the originals. This Siglent oscilloscope arrived. It is an SDS 1102X. It's the new uh, uh, variable persistence low-end Siglent oscilloscope, uh, 100 megahertz. And I have wanted for some time to compare it with the Rigol DS, in, in this case, uh, this is an MSO, but the other, the comparable model would be the DS1104Z uh, by Rigol, which I don't have the 1100, which is the 100 megahertz. Instead, I have the MSO version, which is the 70 megahertz. So that's kind of what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to be doing the comparison with a focus on certain lab experiments, primarily lab experiments that are done in graduate and undergraduate uh, university labs, teaching students to use equipment and giving them a practical information about their uh, uh, what they're learning in the theory classes. Uh, in doing that, I'm going to be using a couple of devices that are made by Rigol and Siglent, respectively. On the left is a device that's been around for a while. It's a DS6000 demo board. And on the right is a device, I'm not sure how long this has been around, a little bit simpler and a little bit cheaper, made by Siglent, which is basically an oscilloscope demonstration board that they make. I thought I would use both of them because that way there's less chance that uh, that I might have a test set up that favors one or the other unit. So what's uh, what's my basic focus here? Well, in general, most labs these days focus either on analog, digital, or RF. Occasionally, you have mixed signal labs where you use a mixed signal oscilloscope where you have digital and analog and you convert between the two and process. More recently, RF embedded systems have begun to be introduced and there are a new class of instruments called mixed domain oscilloscopes that attempt to address that. These are fairly expensive at this point, and I certainly can't afford to buy one just for the purpose of evaluating, so I won't be looking at MDOs. I may at some point in the future look at MSOs, but right now my main focus is on looking at digital 
circuits and particularly the use of oscilloscopes in, uh, in debugging designs and understanding how uh, various kinds of digital logic works. What I'm going to be uh, dividing this up into is an overall section and then each of these vertical, horizontal, the acquisition interface, the triggering options, the kind of decoding available, measurement, the math, uh, which is related to measurement, but it usually means uh, math operations performed between two channels, and usually that also includes a fast Fourier transform, and then the display characteristics. So let's take a look at that with regard to these two scopes, and I've kind of prepared an overview. The Rigol and the Siglent are basically the same in the same class, at least I think so. Now, Dave Jones on EEV blog has already compared the Siglent to the Rigol 2000, at least in a kind of pre-review sense. Uh, I'm going to be comparing it to the Rigol 1000 Z series. That series has a 7 inch 800 by 480, and you see here the Siglent 8 inch. There's a slight difference in memory depth, but frankly that's not, in my opinion, uh, very, very serious. Uh, there is a significant difference in the waveform updates, but you should understand that most of those are uh, their marketing numbers more than engineering numbers. The main difference is the uh, Rigol comes with four channels, the Siglent with two, and as you'll see a little later, the Siglent comes with some options that the Rigol you have to pay for. They both are one gig a sample per second, and they both have variable persistence. The sensitivity of the Siglent is uh, uh, 500 microvolts as compared to a millivolt per division on the Rigol. And here is the basic pricing. Siglent doesn't have a 50 or 70 megahertz version. The first one that is directly comparable is the 100 megahertz. And there, the prices that I got just this morning off the internet, the Rigol costs $830, the Siglent costs $499. There also is a 200 megahertz version of the Siglent available, but because of the sample rate, and you can uh, watch uh, Dave Jones' EEV blog uh, on this, because of the sample rate, I frankly would not buy the, the 200 megahertz version because you can't really use two channels at a time like that. Here are the options. As you see, the trigger options are included with the Siglent, but cost 191 for the uh, Rigol. The decode is uh, extra in both and about the same price. The memory, I could not find a memory extension on the Siglent. There may be one available, so I just put X's there. The record function is $146 with the Rigol. It's included with the Siglent. The 50 ohm terminations, you can buy extra terminations for $18 a channel. They, they look like this uh, from Rigol, but they are included in the uh, uh, inside the Siglent instrument. You can just turn them on. And finally, there the logic analysis, and I've misspelled logic over there, is adds about $368, at least at the 70 megahertz level. I could not find a mixed signal version of the Siglent available. So that's basically the overall view, and I'm going to end this video at this point and pick up the next video looking at the uh, uh, more detailed specs of the two units, and we'll start doing some experiments. One of the first things that I noticed on this, uh, when I first started on this uh, first section, that is the vertical uh, section, get some more light on that, uh, is I'm using a uh, Rigol DG 1022 uh, set to 400 millivolts sine wave at uh, frequency of 1 kilohertz. And both 
units. I set uh, the probes to 10x and the coupling to AC so that DC wouldn't uh, the shift wouldn't have any uh, effect on the input. Uh, and then I pushed the auto and I discovered something very interesting. At 400 millivolts, here's this one, auto. And you see it uh, comes in. You can tell it's finished when the trigger line shows up across there. Similarly on the uh, siglent, on this one it blanks out the display while it's redoing. And once again the trigger line shows up uh, for a brief instant. But both of them seem to synchronize OK or auto set up on 400 millivolts. So now what I'm going to do is go down to 300 millivolts. And you notice that both of them seem to still be uh, seeking OK. So I'm going to push auto set up on this one. And it seems to sync OK, but over here on the Rigol, you see what happens. It, it can't sync, it can't auto set up. So one thing that I think we can sort of figure out is somewhere between 300 and 400 millivolts, uh, probably a combination of internal and external noise sort of overwhelms the auto set uh, feature in the Rigol, whereas in the Siglet it's still working uh, fine down at least below 300. So since the idea was to make a comparison, I'm not going to try to speculate about uh, differences, just that if you were setting up a lab sheet for people measuring small uh, signals, you might point out to them that the Rigol tends to uh, not do a good job on auto setup below about 400 millivolts peak to peak. So let's move on to another test. Now I switch to a square wave still at 300 millivolts and you'll notice over here there's uh, and I've uh, set them both to the same 50 millivolts uh, per division you notice there's a fair amount of noise on that one and a fair amount on that one. I don't know if you can see the relative uh, levels of noise. I'll come in a little bit closer here. But it appears that the Rigol has a little bit more uh, noise than the Siglet, at least the displayed noise. Uh, now neither of these are bandwidth limited and uh, and and frankly a lot of that noise is probably external noise because I'm just using a little breadboard and a 10k resistor to terminate the signal generator once again using times 10 probes but uh, yeah, you may notice that there's a slight difference I think in the internal noise of the two which I believe uh, Dave Jones noted also that the Siglent has a lower noise floor than the Rigol. In that case, it was the, I think the Rigol 2000. Okay, so let's uh, let's try a couple more vertical tests and try to wrap up this part. Okay, now I've gone to a 10 volt peak to peak uh, square wave, still at one kilohertz. The Rigol, the Siglent, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise the frequency. Now you may notice here that uh, this reads the peak-to-peak -peak voltage at 11 point something between 11.0 and 11.5. I'm going to call it 11.25. This one on the other hand reads that as... I'm sorry, wrong place. 10.32 volts peak to peak, uh, which uh, it, it may be I have calibrated this one using the internal calibration. I have not done the internal calibration on this one, so I'm not going to pay attention to those differences. 
but I am going to use those as a reference and I'm now going to raise them up the frequency up uh, to uh, the limit of this which is about 25 megahertz and see what kind of uh, response we get. By the way on the probes both the Rigol and the Siglent probes I found that uh, that frankly the uh, the 10x compensation adjustment is a little bit cheesy on both of them. Maybe a little more cheesy on the Siglent. Uh, and part of the reason is I'm used to uh, Tektronics and frankly Tektronics probes are a lot uh, better in general than these probes and so uh, maybe I'm just spoiled but uh, that's one uh, objection that I think I would make. Uh, anyway uh, it's not a big deal because, of course, Tektronics probes are more expensive, but still uh, you may find that getting the uh, compensation set on these probes is a little bit frustrating. Okay, now let me, let me go up to 25 megahertz and see what, the, uh, what these two scopes show. Well, a little egg on my face on that one. Uh, this is a 25 megahertz uh, arbitrary function generator, but it's only... 25 megahertz in, on the sine wave. It only goes to 5 megahertz on the square wave. So that's where I have it set. And once again, still 10 volts peak to peak. So we're going to press the auto on this one. And that's probably about right. Uh, given this crude setup, that's probably a, uh, a reasonable representation. Now let's push auto setup on this one. The siglent. Okay, well, you see a little more ringing on that one, at least I do, maybe they're the same. Uh, well, I'm going to call them equal in terms of, uh, of their display. And so the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to test the upper frequency limits of the two and see how close they are. The one on the left, of course, is only a 70 megahertz. The one on the right is 100. But to do that, I'm going to have to go to a, uh, a generator like this that will go up uh, above uh, the 25 megahertz that this one will go. And I'll probably just use sine waves to, uh, to do that. So that's the last test, and I'll do that next. I set the siglent to read a 1 volt peak-to-peak -peak signal at 1 megahertz. Uh, and then I raised the frequency of the generator up until the, uh, the signal was down by 3 dB. Now, let me explain a few things you have to be aware of here. One is, you really don't want to use scope probes for this. You want a good impedance match. So this is 50 ohm cable. And you may notice that I have the internal impedance of the uh, signal set to 50 ohms. You have to reset the probe scale because, of course, there's no attenuation in this, uh, in this cable. Well, I mean, there's attenuation, but it's not a, a multiplier probe. Uh, and what I discovered is rather pleasing news that uh, the 3 dB drop-off is at 173 megahertz. That is, even though this scope is rated at 100 megahertz, it appears to have uh, bandwidth out to 173 megahertz, uh, 3 dB bandwidth. So now I'm going to move over and try the same thing in the Rigol. You may have not remembered that when I did the overview, I pointed out that with the Rigol, you have to have buy an external 50 ohm terminator. This is a pass-through terminator. I have one installed on channel 1 right there. So I'm going to move over and do this on the Rigol as well. Well, same test on the Rigol, and same good news. Uh, once again, 50 ohm inputs, uh, 50 ohm output uh, from the uh, generator. Uh, set it up for 1 volt peak to peak at 1 megahertz, and then go up to the 3 dB point. And look at that, 124 megahertz. Now remember, this is uh, rated at 70. So, uh, so once again, uh, about 1.7, guessing in my head, uh, times the spec 
Uh, now understand, this, these are just two particular individual units and uh, you can't really uh, say that all of them will be this good or this bad. But uh, that's impressive performance for a 70 megahertz uh, scope. Okay, well that's the end of the vertical section tests that I'm going to be doing because I'm really just comparing these for use in a university lab, not for uh, all kinds of applications. Uh, and those are the kinds of tests that I normally perform for this kind of thing. And so I'm going to stop at this point and uh, change subjects. Okay, now I'm going to move on to acquisition and horizontal. Uh, I group these two together because uh, they're, they're very much the same thing. Uh, and in fact, uh, some of the modes that uh, I think the Signet puts under acquisition, Rykol uh, puts them under horizontal. So I'm going to call them the same, although they are slight differences in, uh, but they basically are the uh, the time stamps. In other words, one, two, three, four across the screen. That's the acquisition. It's also the horizontal display. Uh, <clears throat> Here are the published specifications. Now, I haven't verified these, uh, but uh, the Rigol uh, time base can go down to 5 nanoseconds of division and up to 50 seconds of division. The Siglent can go down to 2 nanoseconds, and that should be a small N instead of a capital N, uh, and 50 seconds. The capture rate, once again, these are published capture rates, understand uh, that this will vary greatly depending on the particular time rate, uh, time base that you have selected and the particular trigger type and so on. Uh, this is kind of a maximum of 30,000 waveforms a, a second versus 60,000 for the Siglent. They both sample at one uh, giga sample per second. As I pointed out earlier, the, uh, the Rigol has, comes with 12 meg of memory in the segment with 14. You can buy a memory upgrade for the Rigol, but uh, here I'm just looking at what you what you get when you buy the scope if you don't buy any options. They both have an XY mode, and I'll show you that a little later. Uh, they both have a roll mode. The difference is the Siglent can go down to 50 milliseconds uh, uh, per division in roll mode. The Rigol can go down to 200 milliseconds. Uh, then the acquisition, there are basically three types of acquisition that these scopes do. All three do, or both of them do all three. The normal mode, the peak mode, and the average mode. And the difference is that in the peak mode, it looks for the peak of the signal. In other words, if you do an average what you're doing is uh, eliminating the noise by basically averaging several sweeps together. In the uh, Rigol, you can have as few as, as two uh, sweeps uh, in the average up to 1,024. With the Siglent, you, have to, you can only start at four. So basically, you can have an average of one, or in the case of the Rigol, two, four, eight, etc. Uh, averages. Uh, the reason that the peak matters is if you're looking for a, uh, a narrow signal, the ability to sense the peak, and here the Siglent has a, about a four to one advantage over the Rigol. They, they claim that they can, that they can peak detect uh, one nanosecond whereas the Rigol uh, can only do four nanoseconds. But one of the things that I want to show you is this history function that the Siglent has, which I do not think that the Rigol has. Uh, so let me show you that right up here. What I have going on, by the way, you may notice that I turn off the Rigol when I'm not using it. The reason is that uh, I have some trial licenses that come with the scope, like the decode options and, and the extra memory and so on. 
And it turns out that apparently, whenever you have the scope on, you're using the time on those trial licenses. So if you uh, if you forget and go home for the day and leave your, your scope on, you may come back in the morning and find that all your licenses have disappeared. But understand, they're free trial licenses, so it's not like you paid for them. Uh, but I'm saving those so I can use them to compare with the Siglent when I get to particularly the trigger and decode options. Uh, okay, so what we have here is a random uh, signal. Now, hit the stop button over there to show you kind of what it looks like. Uh, it is a uh, sequence of random width pulses and I have it set right now to, uh, and this is, I just did the auto setup. So it's basically using edge trigger. Now here is what's interesting about this scope. It has a button here called history. If you hit the history button, it stops the scope. Now that's no different than hitting the run stop button. But down in the lower right hand corner here you see you have a frame number. What it has done is it has saved each frame of the scope. Now a frame is, is basically what you see here on the, uh, on the display. It's, it's this much data. But it has saved each and every one of those. So for example, if I go to frame number one, right there, you see what, what we're looking at. Then if I go to frame number two, Now that's frame number two, and you'll notice it was different. And the nice thing about this is, unlike regular run stop, let me uh, let me do a a regular run stop. You see there, if you want to look at the uh, at something, you can zoom down. But you're stuck with that particular uh, frame to look at. But the nice thing about the history function is if you hit the history function, you can not only look at that frame, but you can also look at the all of the other frames. And in this case, it recorded... Uh, 3,583 frames. Later, when we uh, look, uh, oh, by the way, also one thing you can do is you can zoom in on each of those. And I don't think I uh, talked about the zoom, but I'm going to add that to the list of features. Both of the scopes have a zoom feature where you can basically change the time frame. And notice the bottom window is basically showing what's what's in the uh, dark area of the upper window. The upper window is what was captured. The lower window is an is an expanded or zoomed version of that. So uh, I think also uh, Dave Jones was a little bit uh, perturbed because I think he got trapped in the history mode and he couldn't get out. I figured out a way to get out. I'm not sure if it's the right way. Uh, by the way, in the in the manual it says if you hit history and then stop. The trouble is if you hit history, it runs. So if you hit stop again, you just get back history. Uh, but what I found is if you do something else, like for example, go to another trigger mode and then do a run and now stop, the history does not come back. It, I think it's recording the history all the time. But at any rate, uh, it's a neat function. I think it would be very useful. Uh, so uh, let me stop at this point and reset to do the XY mode, and then I will stop on the Siglent and move over to the Rigol. I have adjusted the uh, function generator to create two sine waves. On channel 1 is a zero degree, uh, zero phase. On channel 2 is a 90 degree phase, that is 90 degrees out of phase with channel 1, both at 1 kilohertz. 
And then I've applied that to the Siglent oscilloscope. The reason for this is one of the things that's uh, rather important to, uh, to measure is phase difference. Now, here you see it in the regular uh, XT mode where, or I guess YT mode, where you display amplitude in the Y direction and time in the X direction. And when doing this, you can, you can do a phase measurement, but it's not very, very accurate. An old time-honored way of doing this with an oscilloscope is called a Lissajous figure. And all it really amounts to is, instead of plotting time on the horizontal, uh, you, you plot the other channel. So channel 1 is plotted on the, uh, in the uh, y direction, and channel 2 is plotted in the uh, x direction. And that looks like this. Now, as the phase I'm going to drop this by uh, at 10 degrees per. You'll notice that the the circle becomes an ellipse, and when the two signals are exactly in phase, it becomes a straight line, 45 degrees. Uh, you use phase measurements a lot in stability analysis as well as in certain kinds of communications uh, uh, phase detectors and things of that sort. So I wanted to show the way to do a phase measurement on the Siglent and now I'm going to switch and do some stuff in the next video on the Rigol. Continuing with the acquisition in horizontal uh, on the Rigol, here you see the same uh, in phase, that is zero degree phase difference, one kilohertz signals on channels one and two. And in the Siglent, you get to the XY mode through the acquire button. On the uh, Rigol, you get to it through the horizontal menu button. So if I press the menu, the, uh, this comes up, and then if I press the time base, you'll see that it has YT, XY, and roll. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to press that once. And you see it switches. Now we'll, we're going to switch to XY. Okay, I'm back. Uh, it turns out I have not used the XY mode on the uh, Rigol before. It turns out there are a few intermediate steps you have to go through to, uh, to get this. It's not quite as intuitive as the Siglent where you just switch on XY mode and it, it works. Uh, in this, apparently, according to the manual, you have to readjust the, uh, the scale, the horizontal uh, sampling rate, it says in the manual, uh, to get uh, a decent waveform. And also, it appears that uh, in the uh, Rigol, you get a split screen when you go into XY mode. That could be an advantage in some cases, but one disadvantage is it means that the XY display is smaller, so therefore a little harder to read or measure. By the way, you can use cursors on this and you can use cursors on the Siglent to, uh, to measure various things. So this is basically the same uh, Rigol display as I was showing on the Siglent. Uh, once again, the problem that I had with the uh, uh, with not understanding how to use the XY mode is another example of why that uh, Rigol's policy of causing the options to uh, be used up whenever you have the scope turned on, the trial options, means that by the time you've learned a lot of the other functions of the oscilloscope and gotten around to checking the uh, some of the more uh, 
rarely used options. You may not have the trial version anymore. They may have expired. So basically you're, you're learning on your own time, or maybe I should say you're learning on your free trial time, uh, even if you're not using the particular function. So for example, I haven't tried to use the decode functions yet, which I will later, or any of the advanced trigger functions, and yet already the uh, there is less time left on those uh, trials. Uh, at any rate, it's one of those things. I'm not going to harp on it, but it's uh, something that I believe uh, Rigol ought to rethink their options policy uh, and only have the time run off when there's actually a uh, use of, of that uh, trial. Uh, that may be too complicated for them to do in this uh, version, but maybe if they release oscilloscopes in the future, they'll consider uh, letting you learn the option on option time, not on general scope time. So anyway, uh, that's where I'm going to end this one, and then I'm going to uh, move on to the next subject. A very quick uh, addition to the video to uh, just let you know that there are other ways using these scopes to measure things like uh, phase difference and delay and so on. I'm going to save those until I get to the section on measurement because that's where you find them in the scopes. But uh, so Lizard two figures are not the only way to measure phase differences and, and so on. Uh, but like I say, that'll come up when I get to measurements.